All right, this morning I want to talk to you guys about being like Jesus. And uh, I want to pray before we start. So, Father God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for these beautiful people here gathered in your name. God, we want to cry out to you and ask you to come down in power in your presence. Father God, a church without your presence is just a religious gathering without any power. And it will not change and transform society. We want to have your presence. We want to host your presence in this place. We more than just invite you to come. We don't want to just say, hey, Holy Spirit, you're welcome. You are welcome in this place. No, God, it's more than that. We are crying out to you. We are saying, God, without you, we cannot do this. Without you, we can't do anything. We want you. We, we desire you. We are going, we're going after you. Jesus, we want to be like that woman with the issue of blood that went through the crowd in her heart, crying out in faith that she wanted to touch you. Jesus, so many times we want to be touched by you. But this morning, God, we want to touch you. We want to touch your heart. We want to go through the multitude of doubt and fear, whatever it is that is trying to keep us away from you, Jesus. We want to press in. We want to touch you. We want to draw your attention. We want you to come in this place. Jesus, if the blind starts to see, if the lame get, get out of the wheelchair and walk, if the deaf ears are open and they start to hear, if the dead are raised, what are the people going to argue? How are they going to argue? How can they say there is no God? Of course, they, their, their eyes will be open to see that you are real and that they will come to worship you. So, Father, I pray for revival. I pray for revival for the Ottawa Valley. It's been prophesied by Catherine Woolman by um, the Toronto Blessing and Air uh, Fellowship Airport Church.
that's a different kind of love. And um, when the Bible talks about love your neighbor like yourself, when the Bible encourages us to love, it's talking about agape love. And uh, the word for agape love is more connected to uh, charity because it comes from the Greek charisma. The word charisma, um, it's where we get the word charis or charity in English comes from charis. And so doing charity is a form of love. And you don't necessarily need to like somebody you're doing charity to or for. You don't need to like somebody just to be charitable. You don't need to like somebody who is poor or the poor in a certain country to uh, make a donation to that country. You don't have to be intimate. You don't have to be in a relationship. And a lot of times we here in the Western church, we confuse those things. We think that to, to love and to be intimate is the same thing, and it's not. To love and to be intimate are two, two separate things. And you have two different kinds of love. Two different kinds of love. And in John 3, 15, Jesus said, By this way you will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. By this way, by this way, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus is saying that when we love each, each other, in church people outside the church are going to see that love and they're going to know that we love one another and they're going to know that we love god because they will see our love for one another right now how can i see your love i was talking to somebody recently that was uh, i met in a restaurant and i love to start conversations with strangers in awkward places and I started a conversation with this guy. My wife always does this. <laughs> but I can't help it. You know, it was sitting next to this guy, and he starts talking about uh, faith, and, and, and he's, he doesn't believe in God, and he asked me what I did. All it started with, with asking what I did. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a pastor. And he says, oh, you're a religious person. I said, no, I'm not. And then he goes like, oh. How can you be a pastor and not be religious? Because in his head, all he knows is religion. So I told him, no, I have a relationship with Jesus. And, and that's, that has nothing to do with religion. So we start talking, and then um, he says to me that he doesn't believe there is a God. He believes in casualty. He believes in science. He believes in the Big Bang. And I said, well, I think you have more faith than I do. He said, how, how come? I just told you I don't believe in God. He said, yeah, but you believe that everything came from nothing. Nothing created everything. That's that, you got more, more faith than I do. Because I believe everything came from somebody. And so we start talking. He gets a little upset, I think, with me. <laughs> and, 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 then he, and then he says, well, how, how can you prove to me that there, that there is a God? I said to him, do you? love anybody in your life. I love my daughter. I said, can you show your love to your daughter, for your daughter to me? Can, you, can, can I see the love you have for your daughter? He said, well, I, I gave her this and I do that for her. I said, well, those are the things you do, but some people, you know, do things for others without loving them. Like, you know, there's people, they're rich and they have money and they give gifts to their children. They not necessarily love them. He said, you're right. I can't show you my love for for my daughter. I know where, where you're going. I said, good. <laughs> because God is love. And you can't prove, you can't show, you can't put in a Petri dish. You can't put God in a Petri dish. You can't analyze him in the lab, just like you can't do the same thing for the love you have for your spouse or your wife or your daughter or your son. But you know it's real. You know it's real. You feel it. I remember the day the doctor put the baby Lizzie on my arms when she was born. There she is. You heard her name. <laughs> and the doctor placed her on my arms. She was just born. <laughs> she came to my arm. And I felt like God took my heart out of my chest and put it inside of that baby. She did nothing to deserve it. She didn't have time to perform anything. To be right or wrong, she was just born. She was born, and my heart was transferred to hers. 
and I loved her. And I knew at that moment that I would give my life for that baby. I would jump in front of a bullet for her. And you can't explain that. You just can't, you can only experience. You can't explain, you can only experience. It is the same thing with God. Quit trying to explain God. You know, if somebody ever asks you about your faith, don't try to explain God. It's trying to explain your love for your daughter or your son or somebody you love. You can't explain love. Love is not something that can, can be explained. It's only experienced. Does that make sense? So how is the world going to experience God's love? How can we show our love to the world? How can I show the world that I love God. The Bible says that it's how it's, it, it's, I show the world how I love God by showing them how I love you. Showing them how I love you. How, showing them how we love each other. How we treat each other. We treat each other with respect. We treat, treat each other with kindness. We treat each other with love. When the world out there sees us, they see us treating each other that way, they know there is a God. Because a lot of times out there, they, all they see is greed, anger, competition. One trying to pull the rug from under the other. Unrighteousness, cheating. There's so many bad things out there. So when the world sees you treating people with kindness, love, joy, respect, and we are not even related, they go like, come on. I don't even do that for my family members. How can you do that for a stranger? Ah, let me tell you about something. Let me tell you about the love of God. Matthew 5, 44, Jesus said, But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How can we do that? It's hard enough to love somebody from church, you know, that we don't like. And it's, it's you know, I don't know about you, but I think we've got to be honest. And I know you want to be honest too. As Christians, we've got to be honest. Right? The Bible says we're supposed to love everybody. Can I hear an amen? amen. It doesn't say we have to like everybody. Right. And, and like and love are two different verbs. Do you agree? Yes. And to love, especially in the context of, of the Bible, the agape love that Jesus is talking about, the agape love that I owe you, that you owe me, is not the like verb or the verb to like. It's a love that sees a need and meets it, whether I like you or not. That's what agape love is. I see your need, and I go and I meet, I meet your need. I help you with your need. You're hungry, I feed you. You need a shirt, I give it to you. I have two shirts, I, I see you need one, I give you one. You are, you know, walking to work, I have two cars, I give you one. Oh, Pastor Ed, talking about giving a car. I had the privilege of giving somebody a car and a motorcycle to people because I had two. This person, as a good Christian family, had none. The Lord touched my heart. I gave them one. That's what being Christian is all about. It's seen a need. God has provided and blessed you the means to meet that need, and you do it in the name of God. You don't do it because you like that person. In fact, I used to like the person I gave the car to. <laughs> but they messed up so bad that it almost made me want to take the car back. But I did it because the Bible is clear that a gift is a gift. When you give it, it's gone. It doesn't belong to you anymore. So I didn't take the car back. But I still love that person in Christ. I still love that person in Christ, but I don't like them. Because of what they've done. And it's okay. You have to understand. Love and like are two different verbs. It's like forgiveness and intimacy. They're two different things. That's why we are able to forgive anyone that has hurt you. It doesn't mean that you have to be intimate with that person again. Forgiveness and intimacy are two different things. You can forgive and say, hey, water under the bridge. Give them a smile. It's all good. You don't have to be intimate with them anymore. They hurt you. They broke your trust. And trust is something you don't give freely away. Trust must be earned. 
When you first meet somebody, you don't know them. How can you trust them? With time and relationship, you'll get to know the person better. And little by little, they earn your trust. Yes or no? Yes. They ask you for $2. They tell you, I'll pay you on Tuesday. Tuesday comes, they don't pay you. They're losing your trust. Or they're not building your trust. They're not earning your, tr your trust. But if Tuesday comes and they pay you, hey, here are your $2 that I got last week. Oh, thank you. You take the $2. They are building their trust. You are now trusting them a little more. Right? It has nothing to do with forgiveness. If they come to you and say, I'm so sorry. It's Tuesday. I said I would pay you $2. I don't have it. And you say, oh, don't worry about it. It's okay. Right? But hey, the truth is, they're not building trust. And they say, but you know what? Next Tuesday, for sure, I'm going to bring your $2. You say, okay, no problem. Bring it when you can. Next Tuesday, come, next Tuesday comes and they come to you and say, oh, you know, I'm so sorry my cat died. I had to take it to the vet. They'll tell you a sad story. And you say, oh, don't worry about it. You bring the $2 when you can. They say, okay, thank you. I'll bring it next week. And 10 weeks go by. The cat died, the dog died, the grandmother died. His barely left anybody in his family left alive. And the $2 never came up. What is he doing? He's losing your church. He's losing, sorry, trust, not the church, the trust. He's missing opportunities to build trust. Now, if this person needs your help, will you help him? Will you help him or will you help her? Yes. yes, because Jesus said, forgive. How many times? 70 times 7. That wasn't a mathematical equation. Jesus didn't mean exactly, you know, it's only 70 times 7. It was an expression of exaggeration because the number 7 in the Bible is the number of perfection. And the number 49 is the number of the jubilee. 7 times 7 means forgive every debt. So when Jesus says that, he's saying just forgive it. Always forgive. Be forgiving. Because that's how God is with us. Imagine if God only had a certain allotted amount of times He would forgive you. And you would run out of chances. We would be in trouble, wouldn't we? But God has unlimited forgiveness towards you and I. And that's how He wants us to forgive others. Well, it's very important that we understand that doesn't mean you're going to be intimate again. Right? Let's say... Uh, um, Husband is unfaithful to his wife again and again. And it comes to a point she says, I'm sorry, you've betrayed me, committed adultery too many times. I'm done. Oh, please forgive. Oh, yeah, forgive you in Christ. I just don't want to live under the same roof with you. I don't trust you anymore. See, you can forgive somebody and not trust that person. You can love somebody and not trust that person. And we have to, to learn as a, tr as a church that to love means to treat somebody well, no matter what they have done, no matter if you, tr you trust them or not, if you know them well or not, you treat them well. It may be a stranger on the road. You're driving your car. You see a broken car. Somebody's making like, please help me. You stop your car, and you go help that stranger. Oh, but, you know, Pastor Ed, it may be a dangerous uh, spot, and it could be a bad person. Well, use your discernment. Ask the Holy Spirit. But you know very well, so many times the Holy Spirit prompts us to do something, to talk to somebody, to reach out, to stop and give a hand. Holy Spirit does it, and we disobey, don't we? Then later, we feel ba bad about it. I remember one time I was at this restaurant a long time ago, at least 10 years ago. I was in the States preaching at churches. And a certain ch um, church took me to a restaurant after um, Sunday morning service. And we were at this restaurant, and here came this waitress, and she was pregnant. And at the end, uh, we were paying for the bill, and I felt in my heart the Holy Spirit said to me, give her $100. It was my only $100 that I had, and I was traveling from Brazil in the States. I didn't know if the church was going to give me an honorary or not. I, I said, I, I doubt it, and I didn't do it. Man, do I regret it. I regret it so much. To this day, I remember that waitress. To this day, I was thinking, maybe she needed the money for the baby. Why didn't I listen to it? Why, didn't, why was I so greedy? 
Why couldn't I give that $100 and trust that God would give me more? And for sure, he gave me much more money that, and took care of me, and the church gave me an honorary, and that made, made me feel worse because I should have heard the Holy Spirit. You see, a lot of times we hear things like that, and we say, oh, it's just my head. This is not God telling me to do this. Listen, your head's not going to tell you to give money for free. If you ever feel like giving somebody money, that's most likely the Holy Spirit of God. Because our human nature is greedy. We want to take care of ourselves. We have a saying in Brazil, just a little flour, my cake first. A little flour, my cake first. My cake first. It's a saying that we have in Brazil. Meaning, you know, I'm going to take care of me, myself, and I first. If I have anything left, maybe I'll think of you. That's how the world goes by, and, and that's, you know, how they operate. But we are from outside the world. We are from the kingdom of heaven. Can I hear an amen? You are a citizen of heaven. Can I hear an amen? amen. So we have to operate under, under heavenly laws. And I guarantee you, if you don't listen to the Holy Spirit and He prompts you to do something, you're going to regret it later. It's going to bug you. Not the Holy Spirit, you, your own conscience. You're going to go like, oh my goodness, I should have done that. So partner with the Holy Spirit. Next time he tells you to stop to help a stranger, do it. Next time he tells you to give a plate of food to somebody, do it. Next time he prompts you to pay the bill for the whole table, do it. Next time you're eating, you know, it's very common for people to say, you know, one bill, how many bills, separate bills. You know, but it's pay for everybody. Because God is good and generous. And he's got an unlimited resource. The Bible says he's the owner of the cattle of a thousand hills. I love to go to Tim Hortons and pay for the person behind me. You know, I, I tell the guy, pay my bill and the guy behind me. The last time I did it, the guy said, are you sure? They ordered a lot. I said, well, how much? <laughs> See, that's my carnal side, my natural side, worrying about it. And then I just hold, hold, heard the Holy Spirit say, just do it, like Nike. So I did it. And you never know. I don't know. I'll never see the fruit of that seed, but God will. And that's the beauty of it. We are trusting Him. Every time you do it, you're showing God you're trusting Him a little more. You're being a little bit more like Jesus. Do you want to be like Jesus? Do you want to be like Jesus? Yes. Oh, half a dozen people want to be like Jesus. That's good. That's good. Not bad. Do you want to be like Jesus? Yes. Come on now. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. 1 John 3.16. We know John 3.16. For God, let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he, his own begotten son, so whoever believes in him shall not, but have. But this is 1 John 3.16. It says, let's read it together. This is how we know Jesus Christ, his life. And we ought to lay down our brothers and sisters. That means if you can do something for somebody, do it. If God has blessed you with health, God has blessed you with the means, God has blessed you with life, time, do it. That's what being a Christian is all about. It's put, uh, putting others before us, loving others, doing something for others. So how, how do we show love? We show love through, through the things we do. Danny needed a little counter for the flower shop. She asked me to do it. My carpentry skills are very low, very little. I barely have any tools. I have a drill. That's it. So when she asked me to make a nice counter, and she's telling me how she wants the counter to be. It's nice and beautiful and this and that. And I'm thinking, okay, who am I going to call? So I called a couple guys from church. Actually, I called one who called a couple guys. And the three of them got together. And suddenly, you know, they bring this beautiful counter. They install it. And I go to the flower shop. And, they, and Danny is so happy. And Fabia, who works with Danny, they go like, come, come see, come see. They did an amazing job. And I look at it and say, wow, these guys really know what they're doing. I'm glad, I'm glad I didn't put my hand on it. <laughs> I was traveling to Alberta while they were doing it. And so that's what loving our neighbor is all about is meeting a need. You see a need, you can meet it, you have the means to meet that need, you do it. God has blessed you with means, somebody has a need, you bring your means, you meet that need. 
That's what love is all about. You don't have to be intimate with that person. You don't have even to like them. And I know some people look at me weird when I say that you don't have to like people. But it, listen, to love and to like are two different things. I said at the back, I'm going to close that loop by explaining. Love is something you do because you can. That's what love is. You don't like everything your husband says. You still love him. You don't like everything your husband do, but you love him. You don't like when your wife disrespects you, but you love her. So like and love are two different things. Like is like how something makes you feel. For example, you like fish. It makes you feel good when you eat fish. right? You like a game. You like to watch a game. It makes you relax your mind when you're watching that game. Right? You like something because of how it makes you feel. You love somebody because God told you to do so. It's very different. You don't need to like somebody to love them. You don't need to like me to love me. Just love me. You don't need to like me. Just love me. Matthew 22, 37 to 40 says, Jesus replied, let's read this together. Love the Lord your God with... Oh, wait a minute there. Stop. I love this word. You know, while I, I was talking to my PhD professor, I asked him, Dr. Ruthven, could you explain to me the meaning of the word all? And he said, my dear Ed, in the lexicon of the Hebrew and Greek, in both languages, the root of the word all means all. <laughs> all your heart means you're not going to keep a little bit. Okay, I'm going to love Ken. I'm going to love Ken Wood with 75% of my heart. I'm going to keep 25% here because I don't like that he does this and I don't like his goatee. I'm going to love Harish with 80% of my heart, but 20% I'm going to keep to myself because I don't like the way he dresses. I'm, I'm going to love Mark Burns with 70% of my heart, but 30% I'm going to keep here because I just really don't like the way he smiles. <laughs> That's not what God told us to do. He told us to love with all our hearts. Say it all with me. All. all. Say it again. All. And that's our challenge. If we are really honest, we don't love people with all our hearts all the time. Love, our God, love your God with all your heart. We don't love God with all our hearts all the time. We love God with 80% of our hearts, 75%. We try. We want to love with all our hearts. We want to love Him with 100% of our hearts. But it's a journey. It's a journey. You'll get there if you keep trying. But... You know, time and time again, you'll find yourself falling short of that challenge. Do I love God with all my heart? Do I, love, do I really love God with all my heart? Certain time, a young man came to Jesus and said, Jesus, I want to love God with all my heart. What do I have to do? Jesus said, sell everything you have. Give to the poor. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he said. Have we actually given everything to God? Have we given him all our heart, all our mind, all our soul? Does everything we belong, we have belong to him? Does our wallet belong to God? Or maybe 10% of it? I'm just going to throw it there for you to consider. <laughs> Love God with all our, your heart. And it is all, oh, it's not only that, not only all your heart. Wait, there's more. By the way, this is Jesus talking, not the Apostle Paul. Or, you know, it's all scripture, but sometimes, it, I don't know, for me, it's heavier when it's like Jesus said, because this is God talking, right? I mean, it can't be wrong, so I must be wrong. Let's read it again. Jesus replied, who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Who? Jesus. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all, say with me, all your heart, and with and with all your heart. It's interesting that Jesus separates heart from mind and soul. That's why sometimes he speaks to your heart and your mind go, wait a minute, is that really God? 
God speaks to your mind and tell, tell, God tells you to do something outrageous, like give a car away. Like, you know, bless, the, bless this person or bless that person or, or pay the bill, you know, whatever it is. Like one time they came to Chris Volatin and said, after a meeting, somebody came to him and said, Pastor, God told me to pay off your mortgage. He laughed. <laughs> nice joke. The guy stopped and looking dead serious. I'm serious. The Lord and pulled the check. He said, you're kidding, right? He said, no, I'm serious. God spoke to me to pay off your mortgage. How much do you owe? He said, oh, you, you don't want to pay off my mortgage, brother. I just refinanced my home because I had to help my son. They got married. And this, he said, it doesn't matter, Pastor. Just tell me. So, okay, well, it's uh, $600,000. The guy sat down and wrote $600,000. Pulled the check, gave him. Chris Volatil said, oh, shoot. I should have said seven. Because <laughs> later when I sat down and checked the numbers, you know, it was 600 and almost 700. So, ah. That guy was trying to follow God with all his heart and his wallet and his soul and his mind. And this is what we have to strive for, to be all in in this God thing, to be all in in this faith thing. You know, all in, all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is, second is like it. Let's read it together. And the second is like it. Love who? As, ooh, come on, let's turn off the lights and go home. <laughs> Love my neighbor like myself? I don't even know my neighbor's name. Ask the person, you don't have to answer, just ask, who, what's her neighbor's name? What's her neighbor's name? What's her neighbor's name? Oh, look how quiet we've gone. It's Sunday morning, come on, it's church time. We don't know our neighbor's name. Good job. On the right or on the left? What about the one in the back? Two houses down. Yeah. Oh, not bad. Okay, we know their names. Now let's love them. Like we love ourselves. Like we love ourselves. Like we love ourselves. What does that even mean? It means next time you're looking at your neighbor's grass and you're saying, poor job. What do you think that means? You get your lawnmower and you go there and you anonymously do it when he's out to go to work. When he comes back, he looks and goes, there is a God. <laughs> you know, be creative. Let's be creative. Let's be creative about how instead of us being consumed by our problems, I'm a Christian, but I got problems. I got problems. I can't think of my neighbor. I got my problems to think about. <laughs> instead of being consumed by our problems, let's start focusing somebody else's problems for a change. How about that? And then we start to be God for that person. Next time I hear about a problem, how about I try to be the solution? Amen. Oh, come on now. Isn't that what Jesus did? And then little by little, do what you can. Maybe you can't give money, but you can give your time. You hear that somebody's feeling lonely. Hey, come on, brother. Let's sit down and talk. Let's go for a walk. The weather is not so good, so let's down, sit down with Tim Horton and say, Timmy, let's have a coffee. It's on me. Oh, I'm broke. It's okay. I'll pay. Let's sit down. Give your time. Give attention. Really care. Can you sit down with somebody you don't like? And re That doesn't mean I don't like you. <laughs> I like you, Steve. It's just an example. Can you sit down with somebody you don't like and give them your time? Because that's what love is. Give somebody you don't... How about this challenge? Challenge of the week. Give somebody you don't like an hour of your time. <laughs> give somebody you don't like and don't come to me with, hey, I like everybody, Pastor Ed. Hey, I'm going to hang on to you, buddy, because you're going to be drawn to heaven, ascend to heaven like Elijah. And I want to be grabbing onto your leg to go with you when you go. So find somebody you don't like and love on them. Do something nice to them. That's what Jesus is talking about. Love your neighbor like yourself. 1 Corinthians 16. Oh, the Bible is 
full of it. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 14. Do everything in love. L-O-V-E. Do everything in love. Put a smile on it. Come on, show your teeth to somebody next to you. Show your teeth to somebody next to you. Did you brush your teeth this morning? Show your teeth to somebody next to you. Do it with a smile. But I don't feel good. It's not about feeling. See, that's what we get wrong. Loving, love is not about feeling. Love is a decision. How many times you didn't feel like staying in that house with that spouse? But you stayed because you made a choice. And you made the right choice. How many times you felt like not staying in that job? But, <laughs> but you stayed because you made a choice. Love is a choice. You see, we're well, not supposed to be swayed. Listen, emotions come and go. We are 90% water. Some scientists say 70. They, they change their mind all the time. It's a, we are a lot of water. We are a lot of water. And water, you know, is moved by circumstances, right? By the wind, by the, by the moon, the tides go up and down. There's different circumstances influence water. And it's just like us. Some days we wake up and we're like, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and ready to go. And other mornings we're like, where's my coffee? I'll kill anybody who talks to me before I have my coffee. I have a mug my wife gave me. I'm sorry for what I said before I had coffee. <laughs> so we, we, we are, you know, our mood goes up and, and it's okay, we're human. Sometimes we feel great, sometimes, you know, we feel bad. But we choose, we make choices. Love is a choice. Can you say that with me? Love is a choice. Can you say it again? Love is a choice. Last Friday, my wife and I celebrated 21 years of marriage. In these 21 years, do you think that she woke up every morning and looked at me and said, oh, what a great choice I made? <laughs> you think she, wake up, she woke up every morning for these 21 years in love with me and like, you know, ah, looked at me in the morning. But we chose to stay together. And we have good days and bad days and then good days and bad days. The good thing about fighting is making up later, you know, and getting together again and being kind to each other. And then some days we just like, oh, well, after 21 years, you just know. You look at it and go, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, talk to you tomorrow. But <laughs> and it's like that with your boss, with your friend, with your family members, relationships in general. I'm using marriage as an example, but it's relationships in general. If you're a human, you're not an island. You're not supposed to be an island. God didn't create you to be alone. It is hard, terrible, depressing to be alone. You need a family. That's why life is better. Yeah. So find a life group and join it. But you are supposed to be together. And I'm supposed to finish the sermon. So I'm going to go and move on to the last slide. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 7. Let's read it together. Love is... Come on. My six helpers. Love is... Love is... It does not... It does not... It is not... It does not... It is not self... It is not easily... It keeps no... My goodness, that's just right there. I don't feel like I love anybody. After this list, are you paying attention to what we're reading? Man, it's tough. Love is patient. We're not always patient. Love is kind. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're kind, sometimes. Sometimes we're not, especially road rage. Anybody ever had a road rage moment? I was told before I moved here that Canadians don't have road rage. Is that true? I, I was told, just what? We just don't use our <laughs> We just yell inside the car. It, it does not dishonor others. Wow, it does not dishonor others. What does dishonor mean? Well, it's the opposite of honoring. You don't you disrespect. You talk behind their backs. That's dishonoring. Love doesn't dishonor. What else? It is not self. Ooh, that one hurts. As Christians, we're supposed not to be self seeking, thinking about ourselves. Come on, we got a lot of work to do, guys. Right? It is not easily 
Anybody? Anybody easily angered? Come on. Some of us are more, you know, you have two, you know, two main, you have other kinds of personalities, but this is the two main ones. Those that have micro explosions. Pow! They're like this. Don't do that. And others that are quiet, quiet, quiet. And pow! Nuclear bomb. Kill you. <laughs> Not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Mm, women, come on. Women, keep no records. Come on, and that's hard for you. Don't bring it up again next time. Love. <laughs> Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always, always. That's the key word. I want to leave you this, uh, with this sermon as you go home. Persevere. Say it to the person next to you. Persevere. Persevere. God wants you to persevere. God wants you to persevere. Do not quit. You're not quitter. You're not a quitter. Persevere. We have this saying in our family. In this family, we, don't, we never quit. You know, the other day we were um, playing a game with the kids. It's getting tired. Uh, I was getting tired. It's getting late. And, we just, you know, and I said, guys, it's late. Let's just quit. Zion said, in this family, we never quit. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> you know, I, gotta, I, I guess I got to go through with this. It's time for me to quit preaching, though. Let's stand up and let's pray. Father God, help us. Let's say this together. Father God, help us. One more time. Father God, help us. You've given us a challenge, God, to love one another. And it's not easy, but we want to do it. We have a goal. It's our objective. It's like our bull's eye. And we miss it sometimes. God, we are trying. And I pray, Holy Spirit, help us. We want to try a little harder. We want to hit that bullseye. We want to please you. We want to please you, Father God. And it's easy to say that we love you, but it's hard to love our neighbors sometimes. I know some people have a hard time loving me. But that's okay. Because your blood covers it all. And as long as we are willing to try. And I pray, Father God, help us be willing to try to love one another. Help us be willing to try to love even a stranger on the road, our neighbor, whoever is in need. And as we do it, we will bring more kindness and love to this world. And people out there are going to know that God is real because they're going to see you through our actions. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.